Welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rebecca Nelson. I am an Associate Professor at Melbourne Law School and Director of the Centre for Resources, Energy and Environmental Law. Um, so I'll be chairing this panel on fossil fuel litigation. And before we get underway, um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to Indigenous people here with us today. And along those lines, uh, I think it's important for us to recognise that Indigenous peoples are among some of those most threatened by climate change. So today's panel session discusses from a few different angles, fossil fuel litigation in Australia. And our focus here is on litigation that challenges the approval of new fossil fuel projects. So our panelists might note along the way that there are some other species of litigation that might be relevant to fossil fuel developments. So we'll hear a brief overview of the most recent climate change science, then take a glimpse at the origins of fossil fuel litigation in Australia. We'll hear a little bit about the current state of play of that litigation in Australia um, in relation to new coal developments specifically, and some of the new pathways that we see emerging in relation to that litigation. And then finally, we'll focus in on some of the key factual disputes uh, that can pose barriers to fossil fuel litigation and a project that uh, creates a tool that's intended to help surmount some of those um, barriers posed by the factual disputes. So to our speakers, um, in the order that we'll hear from them, I'll just give them a brief introduction with apologies to them for necessarily abbreviating very impressive resumes. Uh, so first, we'll hear from Emeritus Professor David Caroli. Professor Caroli is an internationally recognised expert on climate change and climate variability, a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne, as well as Councillor on the Climate Council. Some of his former roles were uh, with the CSIRO Climate Science Centre, the National Climate Science Advisory Committee and the Climate Change Authority. Then we'll hear from Ella Vines. Ella is a Melbourne Law School teaching fellow and PhD candidate at Melbourne Law School. So her research focuses on whether the Paris Agreement is creating legal pathways to halt or to phase out coal extraction and consumption in Australia. And she's working with uh, Professors Mar Margaret Young and Jackie Peel. She is an Australian legal practitioner with degrees from the University of Melbourne and Deakin and was formerly a commercial lawyer whose practice included litigation and dispute resolution. Then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Fergus Green, who is a lecturer in political theory and public policy in the Department of Political Science and the School of Public Policy at University College London. He's currently visiting Melbourne Law School and Melbourne Climate Futures. His work focuses on the politics, governance and ethics of low carbon transitions. And some of his former roles include practicing as a lawyer in Melbourne, specializing in climate change, energy, environmental and water law, and working as a policy analyst and research advisor to Professor Nicholas Stern at LSE's Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment. We also have Andy um, from Melbourne Climate Futures at the back supporting this event um, and helping facilitate discussion with our online attendees. Welcome to you all too. Okay, so with that, I'll invite um, Professor David Caroli up to the lectern. Thanks, Rebecca. And thank you for the invitations that I've got to uh, present here. Um, I am not used to doing karaoke in this location, um, but I presume that to get the sound quality okay, this is fine. Yep, okay. So I've got the nod. Uh, what I'm gonna try to do is not give what Rebecca said, which was an overview of the most recent update on the climate science, because that's in a list of references and is based on the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is in its printed version, only about 6,000 pages long. But you can download it all, and I've given a set in my references and it'll be made uh, available afterwards when you get access to it, all of the links. What I'm going to talk about is essentially just the science basis for some specific aspects of fossil fuel litigation. And I'm gonna start with this, the chain of evidence that provides in effect the science basis 
for much of the, if you like, litigation that has been undertaken in Australia over the last, well, more than a decade now. What we know is that emissions of carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels adds to the global atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, but the increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide per year is only about 50% of the emissions of carbon dioxide. And not all of the carbon dioxide emitted stays in the atmosphere throughout a whole year. It gets taken up into vegetation and into the ocean. So that's the first part that has to get through the legal debates. Then the increasing global atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 100 years has led to a significant increase in global atmospheric temperatures but it isn't the only factor that leads to year-to-year -year variations in global atmospheric temperatures. So you've got to argue what fraction of the increase in concentration leads to changes in what fraction of global temperatures. Another interesting point and quantifiable, but it is the total atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide that leads to global warming, not just the change in it. That adds to the global warming. And additional global warming then leads to climate change impacts in Australia and globally in many, many different areas. Some of those impacts are actually beneficial in some areas, and some of them are adverse. The magnitude of the adverse impacts is directly related to the level of global warming. But to follow that chain, uh, chain of evidence does not mean that all of global warming and all of its impacts are due to the emissions from a specific extraction. But the most important conclusion from the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is that every tonne of carbon dioxide emissions adds to global warming. Not by much, but by a small amount. And this graphic, which I hope the cursor works, I'm going to point to it with the cursor so that people online can see it as well, I hope. This shows the almost linear relationship between the increases in global temperature and the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide since 1850. And it is that cumulative carbon dioxide increase that's critically important in determining both current and future global warming, because it's the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide that lead to the increases in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And you can see this linear increase, the same relationship, but slightly different slope is the relationship between not only the carbon dioxide, but the carbon dioxide equivalent concentration increase, which is the role of not just carbon dioxide, but also other long-lived greenhouse gases like methane, nitrous oxide, and the chlorofluorocarbons. Both of them have nearly linear relationships. That is critically important in the relationship. And I'll talk about in the next slide when that was first accepted in court cases in Australia. But this is the most important conclusion. There is another one that every increment in global warming adds to the adverse impacts of climate change in Australia and globally. Doesn't say that there's only adverse impacts, but it says that every increment increases the risks of global warming and climate change. So I'm now going to briefly talk about two historical Australian climate litigation cases that I was involved in. I'm gonna start with the one in 2013, and then go back to the one in 2012. The one in 2013 was not my first experience as an expert witness in a fossil fuel related case, but it was certainly an interesting case. Came about in 2013 because of a mining lease by Hancock Mining, which is essentially Gina Reinhardt is the boss of. She will not say she's the boss of it, but she is. She's the largest shareholder in Alpha in Hancock Mining. The lease had been approved. There was an objection put by the uh, 
uh, CCAQ Coasts and Climate something Association of Queensland um, through the Queensland Land Court in 2013. The most interesting part of this case was the court for the first time in Queensland, but also probably a precedent in all courts in Australia, accepted that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Reports provided the best available climate change evidence. They also accepted that cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide were directly related to and the cause of increases in global temperatures. That was an important landmark in litigation in fossil fuel cases in Australia. However, the court did not accept that scope three emissions from the mine or from anywhere outside of Australia were relevant. And that was an interesting conclusion. And that's a legal argument that I cannot get into because I'm not a lawyer. The other case, also an interesting one, was a replacement of existing electricity generation in the Latrobe Valley by a new project that had been approved called dual gas, which is a high efficiency, sorry, argued to be high efficiency, low emission, new brown coal electricity generation project. It had been approved by the EPA. Objections were being heard by the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal in 2012. VCAT found that the dual gas proposal was acceptable but imposed a new condition. And that condition was that the only way that it could, that this new project could reduce emissions was if the same amount of generation of electricity capability in megajoules or megawatt hours was removed from generation from existing brown coal power generation in the Detroit Valley and replaced by the new one. That imposed a cost on the project. So even though the case was lost by the Environmental Defender's Office, this new condition meant that the project did not go ahead. And it's an interesting case where if you lose the case, you might actually win the result that you want. Apparently, there's a saying about battles and wars that is relevant, but I'm not going to argue that this is part of the war of climate change litigation. There are lots of references here to the latest science. You can download any of the relevant ones, but in particular, the regional fact sheet for Australasia, Australia and New Zealand from the science report has most of the relevant science and the regional fact sheet on impacts for Australia and New Zealand has most of the relevant impacts. I'm going to finish up there. I hope I've finished short quickly enough well within time thank you david okay um so we will hold questions uh for a q a section after all the speakers have made their remarks so now to ella i'd like to begin by also acknowledging that we meet today on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the kulin nation and i want to pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging I would like to acknowledge to the ongoing existence of their laws and feel the responsibility that brings to us here as we discuss the contribution of the law to addressing climate change. So here's an outline of what I will discuss today. Um, my research focuses on coal litigation and so I will centre my remarks on this. First, I'll explain, explain the regulatory gap in relation to coal under Australia's environmental laws. Then I will consider how climate litigation attempts to fill this regulatory gap. So David has outlined the science as to why there must be no new unabated coal, because every tonne of carbon dioxide emissions adds to global warming. Despite the science, Australia's environmental laws have been overwhelmingly facilitative of coal projects. This is because Australia's environmental laws only allow for peripheral consideration of greenhouse gases from coal projects. A key example is the National Framework Legislation for Environmental Regulation, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, 
Now, bear with me here because I might get a little bit acronym heavy. Um, but the EPBC Act requires actions that will have a significant impact on matters of national environmental significance, MNESs, to seek approval of the Commonwealth Environment Minister. There are nine MNESs under the EPBC Act. Though actions involving some natural resources are regulated as a specific MNES, for example, in relation to uranium, coal projects are not an MNES in their own right. Instead, environmental impacts from coal projects are considered under the various MNES enlivened in the specific circumstances, for example, impacts on listed threatened species, migratory species, water resources, and world heritage properties. However, actions that will cause high greenhouse gas emissions are not included in the list of MNES, and climate change is treated as incidental to the nine existing MNES. What this means in practice is that greenhouse gas emissions associated with a proposed coal project continue to be considered in ministerial decision-making under the EPBC Act, but are insufficient grounds to review, refuse the development. So what I want you to take from this is that there is a gap in relation to regulating coal under Australia's environmental laws. Now I will discuss how climate litigation attempts to fill this gap. So because greenhouse gases are only given peripheral consideration under Australia's environmental laws, as I've just outlined, arguments grounded in environmental harms of coal not attributable to greenhouse gas emissions have been more material to delaying coal projects than those made in relation to climate change. These include arguments in relation to human health impacts, biodiversity and water. And there are some examples of cases where these arguments have been made listed on the slides. In 2019, though, there was a landmark case where climate change impacts were central to the decision to refuse the mine. So in contrast um, to the Hancock case that David um, listed as an early example earlier, where there were some interesting um, steps forward in terms of acceptance of climate change science, but the coal mine still proceeded. The difference here is, is that the coal mine was refused. Though the legal reasoning in this judgment was significant for a variety of reasons, the reason I will focus on today are twofold. First, that Chief Justice Preston established a line of reasoning through which the Paris Agreement and the science underpinning it supported the decision to refuse the mine. Chief Justice Preston outlined how to address what's become known as the drop in the ocean problem. That is the argument that a particular project or action cannot be considered to have a significant impact in the global context of the climate change problem as its emissions contribution is small. Chief Justice Preston, following the approach of climate science, recognizing greenhouse gas pollution as a cumulative impact problem, emphasized the need for the global problem of climate change to be addressed by multiple local actions to mitigate emissions by sources and remove greenhouse gas emissions by sinks. So essentially he was accepting that proposition that David outlined from the IPCC um, report or that fact that every tonne of carbon dioxide counts. Secondly, Chief Justice Preston demonstrated how to rebut market substitution arguments, also known as the drug dealer's defense which has been a key barrier to, to the success of climate litigation brought against fossil fuel projects. The market substitution argument is essentially the assertion that the rejection of a coal mine in a particular location will make no material difference to global greenhouse gas emissions and resulting climate change because other coal mines resulting in equal emissions will be developed elsewhere in its stead to cater for global demand for coal. In Gloucester Resources, Chief Justice Preston followed the trend of United States courts to examine more closely the evidentiary underpinnings of this argument. His Honour found that there was no certainty of market substitution from new coal mines in other countries if the project was refused, especially given the trend of increasing regulation of coal in large developing countries to meet climate mitigation and air pollution control objectives. The Gloucester Resources reasoning has been followed in subsequent decisions in relation to coal projects. However, it wasn't as though this is the case that every case is now followed. That's not true. Um, and so it must be kept in context. We've got more than half of new capacity in coal worldwide still occurring in Australia. So we need to look at other pathways as well. 
and now I'll turn to where the new pathways are emerging. So we're seeing some new pathways um, to halt coal projects via next generation climate litigation. A significant feature of these newer cases is that the climate change science outlined by David is no longer contested in this litigation and that market substitution arguments are gradually becoming less potent. We're also seeing new types of claims being brought, for example, rights-based claims, claims grounded in novel public duties and corporations and consumer law-based claims. In relation to rights-based claims, a key example here is the Waratah Coal and Youth Verdict case handed down last year, so hot off the press. In this case, the Queensland Land Court refused the mining lease and environmental authority for the Galilee Coal Project. And it was brought under Queensland human rights legislation. It's the first rights-based climate litigation in Australia. And in this case, President Kingham found that the climate change impacts of the decision to approve the mine would unjustifiably limit the right to life, First Nations cultural rights, the rights of children, the rights to property and to privacy and home, and the right to enjoy human rights enshrined in this legislation. Significantly too, um, President Kingham rejected market substitution arguments put before her. Another next generation argument, um, pathway rather, is through grounding litigation in novel public duties. And a key example here is the Sharma case. In the first instance, Justice Bromberg found that the Commonwealth Environment Minister owed a duty of care based in tort law to Australian children not to cause them harm from climate change when deciding whether to approve the extension of Whitehaven's Vickery coal mine under the EPBC Act. Now, this finding was overturned on appeal, but significantly on appeal, the climate science was still wholly accepted by the court and also by both parties to the litigation. To add another layer of complexity about what we can take from this case, when the Commonwealth Environment Minister approved the mine, she relied on the market substitution arguments that I've outlined earlier. And this shows there's still some bite in these arguments, which Fergus will talk about his efforts to dismantle shortly. Another next generation pathway is through claims based in corporations law. Cases have been brought against fossil fuel investors for failure to disclose and address climate risks. Claims which directly pursue fossil fuel corporations are also beginning to emerge. Um, examples to date mainly involve oil and gas corporations, um, but there is an example of a claim in its initial stages brought against coal corporation Glencore. The Glencore claim forms part of a new branch of climate litigation, taking a broad view of the term of what climate litigation is, in which ASIC has been issuing a series of infringement notices to companies that invest in fossil fuel and energy companies for greenwashing. Further, new litigation pathways may emerge due to law reform. In 2022, the Commonwealth legislated a target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43% below 2005 levels by 2030. We don't have any litigation founded in um, that new legislation yet. But in Victoria, where we also have a legislated emissions reduction target, um, there has been litigation um, commenced. Um, I've got the um, reference on the screen. Um, we don't have an outcome of that yet, but that might be an early indication of what we could see federally with the legislated target. Also, um, in other law reform news, um, in 2022, in December, the Commonwealth Environment Minister announced a nature positive plan. The legislation um, will introduce um, legally binding national environmental standards against which development decisions, including coal projects, will be assessed and a federal environment protection agency. It remains to be seen whether these reforms will ensure climate impacts are explicitly included in environmental decision making. Um, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. In February 2023, so you'll note that all of these developments are quite recent, um, the Commonwealth Environment Minister refused the Central Queensland Coal Project. So coal projects are still being assessed on a project by project basis. We've seen an, a refusal from this new government and it will be interesting to see whether we, there will be further project coal project refusals. In April 2023, so this month, um, the safeguard mechanism reforms passed the Commonwealth Parliament, and it's designed to limit the emissions of approximately 215 large industrial facilities, including coal facilities, 
but the ability of these facilities to rely on offsets under the reforms is controversial and litigation targeting any greenwashing in relation to these offsets may therefore have a role to play. So what are the key takeaways I want you to take from my remarks today? First, climate litigation is a key means by which coal projects are being challenged. This litigation seeks to fill the gap left by inadequate regulation of coal under Australia's environmental laws. We've seen that climate litigation is making some inroads in this regard, from the early cases that David described to the more recent cases I've provided a snapshot of. We're seeing advances in the law's acceptance of climate science and a growing resistance to the traditionally pernicious market substitution arguments. Finally, new pathways may emerge, including via next generation climate litigation due to the Commonwealth Government's legislated greenhouse gas emissions reduction target and proposed reforms to the EPBC Act in 2023. Thank you. Right. Thanks so much, Ella. So we'll now focus in on some of those factual matters in a little bit more detail with Fergus. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. Um, and so my my talk will follow quite nicely on from from Ella's. So I, uh, in the last 10 or so years, particularly the last five years, have worked um, primarily, or at least to, to a significant extent on the politics and governance of fossil fuels, in, including fossil fuel production. Um, and, uh, and this, I'm going to be talking about a, a project that I'm working on with my colleague at University College London, Dr. Steve Pye uh, at the UCL Energy Institute. And Steve is an energy systems modeler. Okay, so he kind of models various scenarios um, for, for example, for meeting um, global climate change, uh, global temperature goals and their implications for fossil fuel production. Now, just to say a little bit about how this project came about. So both Steve and I, because of our work different work uh, on fossil fuels and, and fossil fuel production, found ourselves being approached initially individually and increasingly together um, by NGOs working on climate change litigation and also by, um, by climate change environmental lawyers working on, on, on litigation against new uh, fossil fuel projects of the kind that, that Ella's spoken about, and also some of the, the new generation litigation against fossil fuel firms um, directly that Ella also mentioned um, at the end. And we, we found ourselves being asked about a common set of issues and not so much legal questions, but questions of fact that arise in these cases. Um, and I'll talk about some of those in, in, in a minute. Um, but basically we found ourselves having similar conversations with different, uh, different lawyers and NGOs from different parts of the world who were confronting similar questions of fact. And so uh, we put in a, a funding bid to, to create this database that I'm gonna be talking about today as a way of sort of res responding to, those, to some of those concerns on mass, right? So creating a database uh, of the expertise that exists, particularly in academia, but also in, in international organizations like the International Energy Agency, that speaks to some of these questions uh, of fact that commonly arise in litigation, particularly against new fossil fuel projects. So I'm going to talk about something has happened with the slides here in the translation, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the the problem, right? So what are, or the problems more specifically, what are some of these issues that do that arise? And then I'm gonna talk about what the database hopes to do. We're in the process of creating it at the moment. Uh, I'll talk about what we, and, and then I'll talk a little bit at the end about where, where we're up to and, and where we're going with the database and when, when we plan to launch it. So there are four main types of factual issues that, our database will, will address. And so I should be clear that we're not proposing to address some of the fundamental science questions that David addressed. We, we are look, so, so we're not so much looking at the effect of emissions on warming and climate impacts. Our focus is more on the effect of particular projects on emissions. Uh, so, so and, and, and the most significant one that we've been asked about and one that we'll focus mostly on is this market substitution issue that um, Ella introduced. Okay, so you can summarize this, at least the, 
the, the claim that's often made, I'll, I'll use a coal mine as an example, but it could be an oil field or a gas well. So the claim that's often made by the proponents is, well, if we don't develop this coal mine, someone else in, in some other country will, will develop it, right? And, and essentially what it often boils down to is, is an assertion that the demand for, say, coal is, is static, and, and so that supply will always be, be met by, you know, will need to be met by someone. Now, of course, anyone who studied even uh, introductory microeconomics, probably even just the first class of introductory microeconomics, will, will know that this is a claim that sort of flies in the face of economic fundamentals. So that, you know, if you increase the supply of a good, then uh, you lower the price. And if you lower the price, then you'll have an increase in the quantity of that good consumed. So that, and an increase in the consumption of coal will, you know, we'll assume, um, lead to an increase in emissions, right? And so, um, so stated in that absolute way, as it often is by proponents of, of new coal mines and oil and gas fields, uh, the, the claim is wrong, but there will, there will inevitably be some degree of substitution, um, but it won't be a complete substitution. Uh, and so the, the, the battles are usually about the degree of substitution. But once you've once you've rebutted the proposition that, the, that this mine will be kind of fully substituted, that there'll be no effect on demand or consumption of, of coal. Once you've rejected that, then you're dealing with the realm of, you're in the realm of there will be um, some new emissions, net emissions from a new project, right? And, and as, as David outlined, every ton counts. So, um, so there's the, the research underlying this is largely sort of economics and kind of empirical studies of, of energy markets and so on. Um, but there is, right, there is research out there kind of uh, examine the questions, you know, it gets into questions of elasticities. I'm not gonna go, go into that. And I'm not, I'm not an economist myself, um, but basically there are ways of, you know, providing empirical evidence that speak to the degree to which there will be a substitution um, of, of uh, you know, of, of, uh, of the supply of fossil fuels. So uh, that's, as I said, the, the, the biggest issue that we're hoping to speak to in this data, but with this database. There are, there are a few other issues that I'll just briefly mention. So one is that this, uh, this issue of upstream emissions. So often um, you'll, you'll hear the proponent not only say, if we don't develop the coal mine, uh, someone else will. They'll say, oh, and actually, our mine is is greener, and so actually, by by building this new coal mine, we'll actually reduce net emissions. Right? Sometimes you hear this this claim, and that claim rests on the the proposition, both the the, the combination of the market substitution argument, the kind of extreme version, that, and coupled with the claim that the upstream emissions from the production of the fossil fuel, at the at the particular location that's being proposed, will be lower than the upstream emissions from the next most expensive coal mine that will presumably take its place in the, in the supply schedule, right? Um, and so that's also an empirical question that's, that's, that's amenable to empirical evidence. Then there's questions about energy scenarios. So this is very much my colleague, Steve Pye's domain. So, so how do we, you, you can think about this as how do we construct our models of the demand schedule and the supply schedule, right? So how, how should courts make assumptions or, or make findings about the, uh, the you know, demand for coal, oil or gas and the supply of oil, coal or gas? And a lot of that comes from economic modeling, okay? Which is again, sort of a, a sort of factual but kind of predictive type factual question. And then, and then finally, um, and this is sort of an area or a group of issues closer to my own research and interests. It's important to, to emphasize that, and I, you know, and I always encourage litigants and, and, and lawyers to try and make the, this argument in, in cases. It's, it, it's that if you're considering the effects of a new coal mine or the, def, the effects of a decision to reject a new coal mine, well, it's not only the price effect, right? The market effects that we've been largely talking about so far, there, it will also have, it will also create legal precedent. Um, it will build what I've called anti-fossil fuel norms if you reject the project. So global kind of moral and social norms. Um, and, and that might also affect market sentiment 
the perceptions about the riskiness of new investments. So there are a whole other range of consequences that go in the, the other direction to market substitution, right? That actually make it, that amplify the effect of a, of a rejection. And, and there, are, there is work being done uh, on these kinds of questions as well. So the solution, as it were, that we've um, that we've that we're working on, and, and we've received uh, our, our grant funding from the UCL Grand Challenges Initiative to develop a database, which we're calling the Redline Database. And Redline is one of these sort of contorted academic acronyms that stands for Research Database for Litigation Against New Fossil Fuel Extraction. And so, what will it do? So essentially, it'll be an online open access database of what we, what we think, and we'll have some peer review with how we select the relevant um, pieces of research, but basically consisting of academic and other expert research on the questions that I discussed in, and the issues that I discussed in the last slide. So each piece of research, each say it's an academic journal article, will have its own page in the website. And that will include a, legally relevant summary of the contents of that uh, of that article as well as some other metadata like the uh, academics names and the the location of the the the, uh, the academics and so on and it will also link to the original document or uh, the best closest available open access version of that document they'll be able to you'll be able to do keyword searches of at least the summaries uh, and our web developer says potentially the original document as well but at least the, the the summaries will be searchable and they'll also be browsable by issue so there'll be the four issues that i mentioned probably a couple of other ones we might disaggregate a couple of those 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 subjects uh, we might discover a couple of others that we want to add but there'll be a set of i'd suspect somewhere between four and eight uh, issues that we'll cover and you'll be able to browse by those issues and each of those issues will have its own kind of introductory page where you'll describe the issue and provide a little bit of a literature review to the papers that are searchable in the database. So we don't, um, our, so we, we've, we've, our web developer who's, who's developing this, we've, we've had our preliminary discussions. We don't yet have a prototype model. Unfortunately, he's been holid on holiday for about the last month. Um, but before he went on holiday, he did provide us with some like very basic mock-ups. So I'm just gonna present them now to give you a very sort of brief um, overview of what it's gonna look like. Um, and then I'll wrap up. So, so this will be sort of the, you know, um, uh, this is a less colorful page than what it'll be. Essentially be a, a title page where um, you can search uh, and then also browse by the issues. Uh, and then I mentioned there's gonna be this sort of overview page of the various issues. So for market substitution, describe the issue and we'll have a bit of a literature review uh, and link to the specific papers. And then there'll be, you know, it, one of the pages will look something like this, right? So um, this particular paper is not actually about market substitution. We're just kind of plugging in some, some um, you know, some some articles for for illustration but you know it'll be a sort of short summary like that we are hoping we will also be able to link to case uh, cases that have cited that article um uh, and we'll so we'll probably be able to do that um but it'll look something roughly like that so just to sort of explain where, where we're up to so we've we've hired a web developer as i mentioned we've hired a research assistant a fantastic young lawyer who's doing her masters at ucl uh, and has done some work in this area and she's doing the first draft of the legally relevant summaries which Steve and I are then reviewing. We've, we've fielded a survey by some of our partners of uh, NGOs and, um, and, and environmental lawyers who do this kind of work to get their input into like what uh, sort of explain the database and, and, and get their input into features that they would find useful and a few other things that'll inform some of the decisions we make. We're in the process of developing the summaries uh, and the database. So the next step is to kind of complete the summaries and the database over the coming few months. And then we're hoping to be able to launch in September this year. And, and then the plan is that after that, we will have some ongoing research assistance capacity that will review kind of relevant potential new articles or other updates uh, about once a month, and we'll keep the, the database live. And so look, essentially what we're hoping to be able to do is to make, give a, provide a shortcut for the initial steps of researching these complex factual questions so that 
Um, and, and we think that whilst the, the database will be open to everyone, that'll kind of comparatively even the playing field because presumably the large fossil fuel companies can kind of pay their lawyers and to do all this research. But often if you're dealing with sort of, you know, uh, overstretched and under-resourced environmental lawyers you know, around the world, we're hoping that this database will help them to kind of get up to speed on some of the key issues and be able to address them uh, uh, using the best the best uh, research that's available. So uh, with that, uh, I will uh, hand it over to Q and I'll hand it back to Beck and then Q and A. Thanks so um, much, Vegas. Yeah, you don't need this, do you? No, right. I'm good. Oh, hold. Yeah, take it on. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So before we open to audience questions, I just wanted to give our panellists the opportunity to reflect on anything that they've heard from other panellists, um, add anything briefly before we open up the discussion more broadly. So over to you. Does anyone want to add, subtract, edit? Um, I wanted to add to Fergus's idea of in litigation, us needing to make arguments that focus on more than just the market impact of refusing or approving a fossil fuel project. Um, and I think perhaps um, there's a reserved attitude in law to um, talking about things that are perhaps erroneously perceived as more wishy-washy, but I think um, that's exactly the direction we need to go in and um, that really stood out to me. So thanks, Fergus, for raising that. And Ella, I've got a comment that I wanted to make to your uh, discussions, which were really good. Um, there is a case that you didn't mention that hasn't gone to court, but has been under the uh, EPBC Act, and I can do the acronyms occasionally as well, which is available under the livingwonders.org.au site, which was a case that was put to the Minister for the Environment the new minister in the current government, but all the cases, 19 cases of fossil fuel extraction, either coal or fossil gas extraction, had been approved under the PBC Act by the previous minister under the previous government, and they've been asked to be reconsidered. And there are 3,000 documents in a searchable index that can be and is publicly available that allow you to assess matters of national environmental significance associated with each of those projects in all the different locations, also indexed by location, matter, uh, critter, whether it's animal, bird, plant, across land. And I just provided a little of the science background to it. I'll just add to that. Um, thanks, David, that uh, the Galilee coal project that's been refused by the Commonwealth Environment Minister, that was one of the 19 projects that's part of the Living Wonders litigation. So it's already having impact um, and let's let's hope for more. I'm happy to hand it over to All right, great. So let's open for some audience questions um, in the back there. Yeah, uh, Ella, to what extent does the uh, fossil fuel industry uh, shape environmental legislation? Uh, and how does that process work? I imagine lobbying is, is part of it. So maybe you could sort of elaborate on that. Yep. Um, so I think uh, there's sufficient scholarly work out there to support the fact that um, there's a case of regulatory capture um, which means that the fossil fuel industry has had um, a role in shaping our environmental um, regulations and laws. Um, it's certainly, it's certainly there. And um, I think, you know, the broader story is one of Australia's economic reliance on its resources um, and that being um, the way that our laws have developed about the use of those resources rather weighted towards the use of those resources rather than the protection um, of the, the environment at large. Um, Fergus, you might want to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, there's, there's no doubt that uh, fossil fuel industry, both individual companies and industry associations, have used a wide variety of tactics to influence government policy, law, regulation and, and, and rules uh, in every conceivable country in, in which they operate. 
Um, anyone who wants an extreme example can read uh, Steve Cole's book as a journalist about uh, about Exxon Mobil called Private Empire. And uh, but there's 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 plenty of other kind of academic and journalistic evidence of this. Uh, just maybe one sort of useful hur heuristic is the, the, the distinction between kind of insider and outsider tactics. So there's a lot of tactics that happen behind the scenes, but like lobbying, as as you alluded to, Hans. Um, so 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 lobbying, but also donations to political parties and I'm talking globally here right so this is, happens more or less in different jurisdictions depending on how easy it, it is to do these kinds of things um, uh, sort of legally and politically but but lobbying campaign finance and, and, and donations there's there's this so-called revolving door or kind of golden golden staircase golden handshake type relationships um, between the industry and uh, politicians government advisors and so on and uh, and then you've got these kind of outsider tactics as well. So influencing um, pu the public knowledge environment, right? Public relations, misleading claims, uh, advertising, and kind of longer term sort of think tank oriented strategies of kind of yeah sh shifting our, our understanding of kind of what's valuable and uh, perspectives on the role of government versus the role of the market. And fossil fuel industry has has uh, has kind of. Had its tentacles across all of those things, uh, even like children's uh, children's storybooks. So, yeah. Remember, I'm not a lawyer, but <clears throat> scope three emissions from fossil fuel exports from Australia are twice as big as our domestic contribution. So, fossil fuel industry has been particularly keen to hide that to argue that it's the basis of the Australian economy and that is the bigger contribution from fossil fuel and yet is excluded in many cases until the very recent ones. So scope three emissions need to be managed by the Australian government regulations and they are not. Can I just add one quick comment? Um, I think the law is waking up as it were, um, to this relationship between the fossil fuel corporations and um, and the way that fossil fuel is regulated. Um, the Boratire Coal and Youth Verdict case, which is in my slides, um, the coal corporation Boratire Coal referred to the coal proposed to be extracted um, in their documents as the Waratah Coal. And President Kingham, um, the judge in the case, pulled them up on that quite strongly and said, this is not you know, owned by the coal corporation, this is a public resource that could be exploited or not exploited for the public good. So there's definitely a long way to go. And David outlined um, particularly the issue with scope three emissions, but I think um, hopefully there's signs of the law waking up to this and, and calling enough. I said one, sorry, one very small thing, sorry. It actually brings it directly back to the, the litigation question about sort of the role of the relationship between government and fossil fuel companies. So I mentioned that one of the questions that the courts have to answer when faced with market substitution type arguments is, you know, what is future demand for, for the, the product look like? What is future global coal demand look like, say, right? And um, of course, what we know is that governments also actively shape that demand as do the as do often the companies involved right so it, it's often presented as some ex exogenous fact that we can't control that coal demand is or will be projected to be x amount over a certain time frame whereas in fact we we know that our you know part of uh you know the australian government's international relations involve um you know, uh, you know essentially advocating on behalf of the Australian coal industry, right? And so, so there is not been, it's not entirely exogenous, obviously part of it's ex exogenous, but some of it is, is endogenous to the decisions that the government and that these companies are making. So that, that is kind of directly relevant to one of the issues, uh, one of the questions of fact that arises. Fergus, um, from one of our online attendees, I've got another question for you about um, the questions of fact. So the question is, in terms of the evidence that will be available on the Redline database, will you include expert evidence that are relevant to the claims? Yeah, that's a great question. We, we, we've, um, this has come 
come up in some of our consultations with our with our partners and it's been suggested that this would be valuable and we basically agree and I think the difficulty is um, knowing where all the expert evidence is so so you know people like David who who provide evidence before before courts that's actually also very very useful and I think the approach that we're going to take uh, we've sort of effectively agreed this but not not officially is is that we will include expert evidence, but it'll be a matter of, we won't represent that we have everything and it'll be a matter of kind of accumulating it over time. And so we will we will put in, um, you know, bits of expert evidence that are relevant that we know about. And of course, as the database hopefully becomes more, more widely known, people will then send us others uh, and then we can add those to the database. But that is the intention, yeah. Thank you. Other questions from the audience, please. Um, hi, my name is Natasha. I actually have two questions which are kind of unrelated. <laughs> so the first one, um, I've recently read about the EU um, in one of its either soft law or legislated, uh, you know, documents. They've talked about ecocide as a, as a criminal offense, uh, which is you know similar to how homicide is for, for humans and all of that. Um, and also, my understanding is that. Um, in terms of how sophisticated, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, generally countries looking upon the EU when it comes to legislation in relation to um, climate change, environmental protection, also the human rights perspective to it. Uh, to what extent do um, you all think that um, the EU is a good blueprint? And also your comments on if, um, uh, of whether Australia actually um, adopts it in its in its legislation, and I know in Australia, you know, every state will will actually possibly enact their own laws when it comes to environment. Um, so, if just a few examples on that, and the second question is, um, I mean, I may have a very naive perspective to to climate change, but. Um, because fossil fuel industry and fossil fuel is, is fossil fuels in general are you know contributors and massive contributors to um, uh, climate change and pollution in general, etc. Um, but I feel like from an observer's perspective, because I'm not a practitioner in this space, um, I feel the cultural aspect. The mic. If I look at the micro picture, my understanding is the way humans, um, people, all of us, right? The way humans navigate their affairs on a daily basis does play a role. I mean, I could be very naive in thinking, but I feel like, you know, every drop counts. And I haven't lived in a developed country for a very long time, I haven't, right? But I've traveled and I've seen, like from, from, the, from the time when I was a child, it always struck me, <laughs> how people in developed countries take resources for granted. So if at all that makes sense, you could also take that question up, <laughs> but I'll leave it to you. Thank you for the question. So maybe first on the question in relation to the EU. Sure, so just preface this by saying I'm not an expert in EU law um, or ecocide specifically, but what I do know a, a lot about and what I do track is to what extent does Australia sort of take things that are happening internationally in law and adopt it domestically. So specifically, I look at the Paris Agreement, whether that's being adopted um, at Australian domestic level. And I think um, there's sort of a twofold story. I think at one level, um, Australia's got a pretty bad track record of um, not integrating things from the international level at the domestic level, human rights law is a really good example. Um, we're signed up to the human rights treaties, um, but we've done a very poor job of implementing that at the Australian domestic level. So the Queensland, Queensland Human Rights Act is an um, example that counterbalances that, um, but we've definitely not implemented it federally. Um, but the other level to the story is, is that um, certainly in climate litigation, we are seeing inspiration taken from other jurisdictions as part of a transnational regulation um, of climate change. Um, the Agenda decision, um, which was a Dutch decision, definitely um, influenced the litigation strategy in the Sharma decision, for example. So that's quite a complex answer, but I think that um, the EU ecocide example, um, it would be 
interesting to see um, whether that is taken up in Australia and we'll have to wait and see. The second question is probably one for a longer a longer chat sometime. But I mean, yeah, I mean every drop counts, right? Right. But but I think what we what we're focused on in this kind of discussion is sort of the the really big projects, right? That make a really big difference, and not not so much to say that we shouldn't be concerned about personal consumption decisions. I think that that matters, but um, certainly my instinct is to focus more structurally on what are the main underlying drivers, right? There are there are limits to what individuals can do and I think we're better off focusing our efforts on collective policies laws litigation that change the structures in which individuals act without discounting that individual decisions also matter that's how I would think about it yeah. I guess just to that point as well so my research is in um, the regulation of cumulative environmental effects and effective collection action solutions are just unlikely to arise where there's very large numbers of heterogeneous actors undertaking heterogeneous activities, which is the case for personal consumption decisions. So I, I agree there's a role to play there, but in the absence of a regulatory approach, it's, it's hard to see that there would be a compelling, you know, sufficiently effective collection action solution um, that'll happen soon enough. I think we might have time for one more question. Um, looks like we don't have any more questions from online. Any other questions from the audience? The Great, that, yes, that, please. Hi, I would just like, I was just wondering how an Indigenous voice to Parliament would help um, fossil fuel, fuel lit litigations. Interesting question. Over to the panel. I think that's a hypothetical at the moment. Um, we can hope that an Indig Indigenous voice to Parliament would certainly um, play a role. What I can speak to is that um, Indigenous voices are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in relation to climate litigation. We've had the Torres Strait 8 case that's gone to the Human Rights Committee at the international level where human rights violations were found um, um, due to Australia's lack of um, action on climate change. Um, there's the Pabai case um, that's happening at the Australian domestic level. Um, there was Indigenous involvement in the youth verdict um, case that I mentioned. Um, so certainly Indigenous voices are um, doing a lot of the heavy lifting here and we can certainly look to other forms where those Indigenous voices are elevated. Um, but we can't just let them do all the work. We've all got to do it. And specifically on that, topic. I'm not sure if you've heard of SEED, but it is the Indigenous-led component, well, grew out of the Australian Youth Climate Coalition. It is now an Indigenous Youth Climate Coalition, specifically acting and led by Indigenous peoples, young people, to stop fossil fuel extraction on Indigenous and other lands across Australia. But it is the voice from Indigenous youth. All right. Thank you all. We are out of time, unfortunately, but speaking for myself, I, I think this is an exciting, um, we've heard some exciting news about climate change litigation in Australia. Maybe qualified excitement is, is the, the vibe to leave with, um, but I'd like to invite everyone to join me in thanking the panel for leaving us with that. <laughs>